Morning, everyone. A quick, huge thank you to everyone who donated to the sponsored events for the BB. We're now at a grand total of £1,054. So thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at Grahamston United Church. And a particularly warm welcome to our young people and their families and friends who are worshipping with us this morning. It's good to be reminded that our young folk are also part of our church family. I only have one intimation, and that's that next Sunday we will celebrate the sacrament of baptism um, of James Riley. My call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 148, and it's, I'm reading from the message version of the Bible, and the readings that the young people will be leading us in are also from the message version. Hallelujah! Praise God from heaven. Praise Him from the mountain tops. Praise Him, all you His angels. Praise Him, all you His warriors. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, you morning stars. Praise him, high heaven. Praise him, heavenly rain crowds. Praise, oh, let them praise the name of God. He spoke the word, and there they were. He set them in place from all time to eternity. He gave his orders, and that's it. Praise God from earth, you sea dragons, you fathomless oak ocean deeps, fire and hail, snow and ice, hurricanes obeying his orders, mountains and all hills, apple orchards and cedar forests, wild beasts and herds of cattle, snakes and birds in flight, earth's kings and all races, leaders and important people. Robust men and women in their prime, and yes, grey beards and little children. Let them praise the name of God. It's the only name worth praising. His radiance exceeds anything in earth and sky. He's built a monument, his very own people. Praise from all who love God, Israel's children, intimate friends of God. Hallelujah. And let us worship God in our opening hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you because you are the King of creation. We thank you that there is no one and nothing greater than you. You are greater than anyone who has ever lived, greater than anyone yet to be born, and greater than anyone living today. We thank you because you made our world worth living in. You planned this to be a place where we can find happiness, joy, and real life. You always wanted everyone to feel loved, wanted, and of real value. You meant everyone to live in freedom and without fear. You made your world and filled it with hills and valleys, seas and oceans, streams and rivers, plants and animals, birds and insects, and fish and fruit. But you also gave us the freedom to choose. We have chosen at times to please ourselves, and we have broken your laws. We have spoiled your world, as we have sometimes spoiled our lives. Lord, we thank you that you loved us enough to send Jesus, and we praise you that he is the door to your kingdom. We are sorry that we give in to temptation and that we find it so hard to stand firm for you. Forgive us when we are weak and help us because you are the king of the kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name and as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, we too pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 148 that I read at the start of the service reminds us all that God created what God created here on earth. It reminds us that he created every living creature, every plant and tree, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the planets, the rain and the snow and the sunshine. Can anyone tell me how long it took God to create the world and all that's in it? Anyone? You girls should know. Just about seven days. Seven days, right. But the question is, was it seven days as we know them? Was it seven periods of 24 hours? Or was it maybe seven stages? You see, there are lots of people who don't believe in the creation story. They don't believe the world was made in seven periods of 24 hours. They say that the world was created from the Big Bang, and that after the Big Bang there was evolution. What these people aren't able to tell us, though, is who or what caused the Big Bang. Certainly they don't believe in God, so they don't think God made the Big Bang, or even that he made some kind of machine that started with a Big Bang to make the universe as we know it. And scientists are able to tell us that the first creatures on Earth were dinosaurs, which roamed the Earth for thousands of years before human beings arrived. And these scientists talk about evolution, and they laugh at the idea that God created the world in seven days. They laugh at the very idea that there is a God. But there's one scientist, a neuroscientist called Dennis Alexander, who wrote a book called Creation or Evolution? Do We Have to Choose? Now, this scientist believes strongly in what the Bible tells us about creation, but he also believes strongly in evolutionary theory. 
In fact, he believes we don't have to choose between creation or evolution. He believes that both make sense and that both represent a way of understanding how the universe and our world came into being and how it developed. Now, it's a while since I read that book, but I remember being fascinated by how Dennis Alexander was able to compare the Bible story of creation with what scientists have discovered about evolution. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God made heaven and earth and separated light from darkness, that he called the light day and the darkness night, and that this happened on the first day. And then on the second day, God separated the sea from the sky. Then on the third day, he gathered up some of the sea water so there would be some dry land, and he called the dry land earth. And he decided that the earth should produce plants and trees, fruit and seeds. Then on day four, according to the Bible, God made the sun, moon and stars and divided the year into seasons. On day five, he filled the seas with fish and other sea creatures, and he also made birds. And then he decided that the earth should have lots of animals of all different kinds. And then on the sixth day, he decided to make human beings, and he gave them power over all living creatures. Then on day seven, God rested and made the seventh day a day of rest for human beings. And he made it holy. He made it a holy day when we're supposed to be worshiping him and giving him thanks. Dennis Alexander, on the other hand, uses scientific research to show how the creation story in the Bible and the theory of evolution have similar stories to tell about how the world began and how it developed. The only real difference is that science doesn't see evolution in terms of seven periods of 24 hours, but sees it as having developed possibly in those seven stages over millions of years. So perhaps the Bible story uses the words hours, days, and weeks as a simple way of helping us to understand just how God did it and how he is still working in the world. Let us sing together our next hymn, Jesus Puts This Song Into Our Hearts. And now, oops, <laughs> sorry, I'd forgotten you guys were going here.
I now invite Kieran to come and read our first Bible lesson. The first reading is taken from Acts chapter 11, verses 8 to 18. Eh, 1 to 18, sorry. The news travelled fast, and in no time, the leaders and friends back in Jerusalem heard about it. <laughs> heard that the non-Jewish outsiders were now in. When Peter got back to Jerusalem, some of his old associates, concerned about circumcision, called him on the carpet. What do you think you're doing, rubbing shoulders with that crowd, eating what is prohibited and ruining our good name? So Peter, starting from the beginning, laid it out for them, step by step. Recently, I was in the town of Joppa praying. I fell into a trance and saw a vision, something like a huge blanket lowered by ropes at its four corners, came down out of heaven and settled on the ground in front of me. Milling around on the blanket were at farm animals, wild animals, reptiles, birds, you name it. It was there. Fascinated, I took it all in. Then I heard a voice. Go to it, Peter. Kill and eat. I said, oh, no, master. I've never so much as tasted food that wasn't kosher. The voice spoke again. If God says it's okay, it's okay. This happened three times, and then the blanket was pulled back up into the sky. Just then, three men showed up at the house where I was staying, sent from Caesarea to get me. The spirit told me to go with them, no questions asked, so I went with them. I and six friends, to the man who had sent for me, he told us how he had seen an angel right in his own house, Israel's his next door neighbor, saying, send to Joppa and get Simon, the one they call Peter. He'll tell you something that will save your life. In fact, you and everyone you care for. So I started in, talking. Before I'd spoken half a dozen sentences, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he did on us the first time. I remember Jesus' words. John baptized with water. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I ask you, if God saved the, gave the same exact gift to them as to us when we believe the Master Jesus Christ, and how I could object to God. Hearing it all laid out like that, they quieted down. And then, as it sank in, they started praising God. It's really happened. God has broken through to the other nations, opened them up to life. Thank you, Kieran. Every organisation has rules. Rules to keep everyone safe, rules about respecting those in charge, rules about behaviour. I confess I don't know what the rules of the Boys' Brigade are, but the internet tells me that the mission of the Boys' Brigade is to provide opportunities for boys and young men to learn, grow and discover in a safe, fun and caring environment which is rooted in the Christian faith and that the values of the Boys' Brigade are to inspire, challenge and be caring. Having been a guide myself when I was young, I'm aware that the guides have ten laws. And although the wording of the laws is a bit different from the ones I knew, they are basically the same as they were in my day. And these rules are about being loyal, trustworthy, helpful, polite, considerate, friendly, respectful to all living things, obedient, courageous, caring of possessions, and self-controlled. So one way or another, both the BB and the guides share similar values, and they're basically the same values that Jesus taught his disciples 2,000 years ago and which Christians are expected to follow today. In order to be a member of the BB or the Guides, young people are expected to accept the values of these organisations and to live by them. And in the same way, in order to call ourselves Christians, we're expected to share the values, the rules and the vision that Jesus taught all those years ago. Now, obviously, the very first Christians were Jews, because Jesus was a Jew, and so were all his disciples. But Jesus challenged some of the Jewish laws, not because they were wrong as such, 
After all, God had made most of them. And like most laws, God's laws were meant to keep people safe and healthy, to ensure people looked after each other, and to ensure that people were cared for and treated well by others. The trouble was, though, that some of the Jewish lawyers of the time turned what should have been straightforward rules into complicated nitpicking rules that often made no sense whatsoever. It was the Jewish people who first heard about Jesus and his teaching. And so the very first Christians were obviously Jews. But some of the newly converted Jewish Christians saw non-Jews as outsiders and felt that in order to be in with the in crowd, these non-Jewish Christians should have to become Jewish. So when Peter heard that some of his fellow Jews were insisting that non-Jews who wanted to become Christians had to convert to Judaism first and follow all the same rules that the Jewish authorities laid down, he was pretty annoyed. He felt it would be about as sensible as saying you had to join the guides in order to join the BB, or to join the BB in order to become a guide. It made no sense at all. And the Jews had a lot of rules, and among others there were rules about what kind of food you could eat, and what kind of food was considered clean or unclean. So in order to make the point that new Christians didn't have to convert to, to being Jewish, first of all, Peter told them of a vision which God had sent him. God had sent him all kinds of food regarded by Jews as unclean and therefore not to be eaten. And in this vision, Peter said to God, eat it. And Peter said, oh no, I can't put anything in my mouth, it's unclean. Then God told him that he had made all food fit to eat, and so he did accept it. And so Peter then went and preached the message that God is on the side of everyone. Jesus' message is for everyone, and there aren't complicated rules to follow. All God expects is that we love him and respect his sensible rules and most of all, that we love each other. Our next hymn is, I am the church. And so it's in recognition that we are all members of Jesus' family. I am the church.
Leah will now read our gospel reading for us, um, which when is John. When he had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of the Man is seen for who he is, and God seen for who he is in him. The moment God is seen in, the, in him, God's glory was being on dis display. In glory, glorifying him, he himself is glorified. Glory all around. Children, I am with you for only a short time longer. You are going to look high and low for me, but just as I told the Jews, I'm telling you, where I go, you are not able to come. Let me give you a new command. Love one another in the same way I loved you. You love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples. When they see the love you have for each other. Thank you, Leah. That was brilliant. Our next hymn is based on that reading and it's called A New Commandment and we'll sing it twice. The story that we heard from John's Gospel is one of the clearest stories about Jesus' unconditional love for everyone. And it's a reflection of God's unconditional love for all his people. The love that his son Jesus showed in all he said and did during his time on earth. The love that enabled him to touch and heal people who others avoided like the plague because they had horrible diseases or were seen as not fit for human society. People that strict Jews would not want to be seen near, far less speak to or, heaven forbid, touch. The strict Jews of Jesus' time would not have wanted themselves to be made ritually unclean by going anywhere near these people. But Jesus was different. He was totally different. He was a different kind of Jew altogether. He was a Jew who saw the face of God in every other human being, no matter how poor, how sick, how bad, how beyond saving others might have thought them. 
Jesus was just love personified. Now the events of the story took place the night before Jesus was crucified. He and his disciples had been celebrating the Passover, the meal that came to be known as the Last Supper. And Jesus knew what lay ahead of him. He knew that one of his closest friends was going to turn him over to the Roman authorities to be tried as if he was a common criminal and that he would face the death penalty. He knew that another of his closest friends, one of the first people he called to be his disciples, would deny ever knowing Jesus for fear of meeting the same fate as Jesus. Two people who'd been by Jesus' side throughout the three years of his ministry, two people he had trusted all this time, were going to let him down big time. Jesus even went so far as to tell both of these men just how they were going to let him down. But both of them denied it and said, no, 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 we'd never do such a terrible thing. But Jesus knew that when the chips were down, both of these men would let him down. Judas would turn him over to the authorities and Peter would pretend he had never known him. Jesus probably also knew that Judas would feel so guilty about what he had done that he would take the easy way out and commit suicide too ashamed to live with his guilt and his conscience. As for Peter though, Jesus chose to keep his promise that Peter would be the rock on which Jesus' church would be built. Peter's regrets and his conscience would make him step up to the plate and spend the rest of his life carrying on Jesus' message, telling people about Jesus and bringing them to faith. A faith that's still alive today and that still reaches people who had never heard of Jesus until recently. People who, like Jesus himself, are prepared to put their lives on the line for him in countries where Christianity is against the law and where people face torture and even execution for worshipping him. But knowing all of this and knowing that he would be let down badly by his friends didn't make Jesus angry or bitter. It didn't make him give up on these unreliable men or the rest of the disciples. Jesus still trusted them to carry on his work. So instead of reading the riot act, instead of being angry with him, instead of telling them all to get lost, Jesus gave them a new commandment a new rule to follow. He reminded them of how much he loved all his disciples, even the two who would let him down. And he gave them an order, an order to love each other in the same way that he loved them. But the order was more than that. It was an order to love not just each other, not just their friends, it was an order to show love for every human being they came across, even those that it might be hard to love. And he expects all of us, his modern day disciples, to love each other too, to love each other unconditionally. That doesn't mean we should put up with unkindness or selfishness or any other kind of unacceptable behavior. Just as Jesus did with Judas and Peter, we're entitled to point out to others when they're hurting us. But that should never stop us loving others. We're not expected to love the bad behavior, but we are expected to love the person, just as Jesus loves everyone. Amen. Your offering will now be brought forward.
Let us once more come to God in prayer. Let us pray. There is a response in this prayer, so when you hear me say, Lord, in your mercy, I'd like you to reply, hear our prayer. Loving God, in grateful thanks for all you have given us and keep on giving us, we bring you these our offerings of money and ourselves to be used for the growth of your kingdom. And Lord, we bring to you too our prayers of intercession. Heavenly Father, we pray for your creation. You gave us responsibility for all that you have made. You entrusted every living creature into our care. But we have at times betrayed that trust and neglected our responsibility. We've allowed your good earth to become polluted by our greed, damaged by our selfishness, and sucked dry by our materialism. Father, by your Holy Spirit, give us a renewed urgency to fulfill the task you laid upon us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for governments all around the world, for those whose decisions will affect the whole of your creation, for those who ignore the implications for future generations of the decisions they are making today, for the leaders of nations who are genuinely seeking to behave responsibly, to act justly, and to be faithful stewards of your creation. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for ordinary men and women, for those with whom we work and those with whom we share our lives, for those whose daily work crushes out of them any real sense of being your children. We hold up before you any who find their work a toil, their employment a burden, and their horizon bounded only by time and space. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who look at your creation but do not see you, for those who can marvel at the wonders of your world but never lift their hearts to worship its maker, for those for whom life is no more than the things they can see or hear or touch, and for those whose lives are so dominated by material things and by the pleasures of the moment that they are leaving no space for the things of heaven or the Lord of eternity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those whose trust is in the riches they can hold and store, but who remain paupers in your sight. For those who have made an idol of created things and human achievement but are powerless to give meaning and purpose to their own lives. For those who, because of age or disability, are disregarded by success-oriented society. For those who are caught up in the rat race of life, and also for those it leaves behind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for any who are finding that the pressures and stress they face each day mean that their joy in living in your world is simply being drained away. For those who use their skills of writing, singing, painting or performing to draw others closer to you. For scientists whose discoveries provide us with even more reasons to worship you as our creator. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for ourselves. We are your creation. We acknowledge that we are wonderfully made. We are capable of amazing acts of kindness, love and understanding. Yet we also know our need for your healing, loving, forgiving, transforming grace. We ask you to touch our hearts with your love, our lives with your grace, and our lips with your truth. Enable us to live that others may live in you. Empower us so to speak that others may glorify you. Lord, in your mercy, 
We ask our prayers in the name of Christ, the Lord of time and space and eternity. Amen. We conclude our worship with the hymn, One More Step Along the World I Go. Go into God's world in the assurance of his presence, the knowledge of his goodness, and the certainty of his love. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. We'll now sing the national anthem. Mm -hmm. 